So good afternoon. My name is Fanola Finnan. I'm the Deputy CEO in Throkra and I'm the Chair of the Dokas Network. And I'm really pleased to welcome you for this, the fifth webinar in the IIE Development Matters Lecture Series, supported by Irish Aid. We are absolutely delighted to be joined today by Ms. Yasmeen Sharif, the Director of Education Cannot Wait, and who's been generous enough to give her time out of a very busy schedule to speak to us. So thank you. Education Cannot Wait is a global fund for education in emergencies and protracted crisis, established at the World Humanitarian Summit and hosted by UNICEF. A human rights lawyer with 30 years of experience in international affairs, Ms. Sharif joined the United Nations in 1988 and served in New York, Geneva, and in many crisis affected countries in Africa, Asia, the Balkans, and the Middle East. The topic she'll speak to is Africa's forgotten crisis, global education, COVID-19, and the climate emergency. The triple crisis of COVID, climate, and conflict has had and continues to have a devastating impact on the lives of millions of children, including in education. Ms. Sharif will speak to her vision of how to mitigate the impact of these intersecting crises at a time of unprecedented need. And this conversation is timely in the wake of the UN General Assembly in New York, ahead of COP26, and as Ireland continues its term on the Security Council. You'll be able to join the discussion using the question and answer function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Um, please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we'll come to them once Ms. Sharif has finished her presentation. I would ask you please to identify yourself and your organization or affiliation, if that's appropriate, in the question and answer function. I'd also like to remind you that today's presentation and question and answers are on the record. Please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. We're also live streaming this afternoon's discussion, so a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining via YouTube. Um, Ms. Sharif will speak to us for about 20 minutes, and um, then we will go into the Q&A questions with the audience. So, um, But before I hand over to her, I'd like to give the floor to Rory de Barca, who's the Director General of Irish Aid, to deliver some opening remarks. And as we all know, A Better World, Ireland's policy for international development sets out a clear ambition to increase our support for education, especially for girls in emergencies. And it continues Ireland's long tradition of supporting education. So over to you, Rory. Thank you. Thanks, Vanula, and um, hello, everyone. I'm particular, particularly delighted to be here to, to welcome um, Yasmin, um, because I think Yasmin is a pioneer. Um, education is something that we know from our own story, how important education is for development. But one of the challenges, I think, in development has been that separation between humanitarian, the nexus question, between humanitarian action and development. And that has meant that for, traditionally, education was always viewed as a development question rather than something that had to happen in, in crisis situations. And Yasmin has been a pioneer in bringing to our attention um, the need to give education in crisis situations and particularly in prolonged humanitarian emergencies. Many children spend their entire education lifetime in, in refugee camps, for example. So the formation and, and direction of education can't wait since the Global Humanitarian Summit in um, World Humanitarian Summit in 2016 is something which Yasmin has led. Uh, and, and she's challenged many of us um, to, to think again about how we allocate money and the kinds of questions that we as donors uh, or as organizations, you know, ask around our intent and uh, you know and, and she's been very inspirational at building political support but also putting in place real practical measures to deliver uh, education uh, to people in, in in really difficult circumstances and I was on a privilege to be at a meeting with Yasmin earlier in the week where the question of what you know education can't wait or cannot wait what would do uh, and was doing in, in Afghanistan w w was very present and in the room. And I think we've all sort of, the events over the last six, eight weeks have really, you know, reminded us all how, how important that question is. Uh, Irish Aid is a, is, a, is a, you know, is proud to be a, a supporter of Education Cannot Wait. But I'm particularly pleased that, you know, Yasmin is going to talk to us today, you know, on, on the linked question of education, with COVID and the climate emergency, because 
you know, it's it's unfortunate, but it's true that too many children, particularly in Africa, which will be the focus, have had their education broken by by COVID. Many girls won't come back to school, unfortunately, uh, and will fall into early marriage and other poverty traps as a consequence. You know, male preference is definitely back on the table. And what we've seen over the last year, uh, I think, in, in through through the pandemic, you know, will only be amplified as the climate emergency gets gets um, unfortunately more more marked. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what what Yasmin has to say, and I think it'll be uh, both profound and provocative uh, because that's who Yasmin is, and I think she will leave us with some really really good questions, um, you know, to 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 on which to to reflect and take forward uh, as we work, you know, as donors or in agencies or uh, in our engagement with, with those whom we want to influence on questions to do with development. So, Yasmin, really delighted that you're with us here today, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Rory, for those very kind words. I'm not sure I deserve them all, but you have been very generous. Thank you very, very much. And thank you, Fenola, also for your introduction, uh, making me feel very welcome. I'd like to start off by thanking um, Irish Aid and the Institute of uh, International European Affairs to organize this very, very important event. It's important for all of us globally. And also, I know it's not yesterday, but to congratulate the government of Ireland for making it into the Security Council. Um, your voice is much needed in today's world uh, to steer multilateralists back to human rights. Uh, and that is something that you have made a mark on all of us for decades and the long history. So thank you very much for that. We, we are, I'm very happy when I saw that. Ireland made it into the Security Council. And I hope that we can bring education into the Security Council through you and cooperate on that. And maybe I should start, my colleagues are telling me, please start off also by saying that your, your, your article on education, my article on education kind of must come first, was just published by the Project Syndicate today. Uh, and, and I think we are all provocative here. Uh, certainly, I know that Ireland is a provocative and profound country, so I look forward to making that connection. Now, in impact, um, and I'll start here now with the impact of COVID-19 on education uh, across the globe. Um, so the United Nations, and I'm going to switch over to my points here so I can read and look at your eyes. So the United Nations estimates that since March 2020, 1.5 billion children and youth have experienced prolonged interruption to their education caused by school closures during the pandemic. And UNICEF has found that 31% of students lack access to remote and distance learning opportunities. 31%, that's a huge number in the world population. And in the absence of such opportunities, children and youth have experienced learning losses that are equivalent to a period far long, longer than the duration of the actual school disclosures. Now, these learning losses are likely to impact the poorest and the most marginalized children and youth. Remember this, when you have a crisis, a pandemic like this, it will always be those left furthest behind already before it took place that will be the most impacted because they have the less preparedness and the less socioeconomic resources to actually protect themselves in the midst of uh, a pandemic or other global uh, peril. So they are the ones who have the fewest opportunities to continue their education because of disruption. And I'm here speaking on behalf, uh, as education cannot wait, for the children who are caught in armed conflicts, who are already uh, living in forced displacement as refugees are internally displaced, or affected by climate and news disasters. And then on top of it, and of course they're all affected by extreme poverty, by the fault of their situation. And then on top of it, we have uh, a pandemic such as the COVID-19. So given this background numbers, many of these children and young people or adolescents are now at risk of never returning to schools ever again. And schools are reopening. Just imagine never returning to school. 
And here we need to stress the situation of girls. Uh, they are have a much stronger threat and increased drop of dropout due to also to violence. That's an additional trauma into the life besides the, the, the crisis context and the pandemic, but girls and adolescent girls are at increased risk because of violence at home, uh, social pressure, uh, such as early marriage. And here UNESCO estimates that 11 million girls will drop out of school due to the economic impacts COVID, uh, affected, caused by COVID-19. 11 million girls will never go back to school. They get pregnant, they will be uh, subjected to sexual gender-based violence, gender-based violence, and early marriages. And um, so we're speaking about millions of girls here who are in the zone of absolute threat to their existence and future. Now, even when a girl remains in school, um, it is est estimated that they normally undertake three times more caring responsibilities than boys. So besides being in school, being in a conflict, being a refugee, COVID-19, even if they are in school, they also have to cater to um, house, household scores and, and many other responsibilities. And we have seen evidence from this that during the Ebola crisis in Africa, which, which show that the girls bore the brunt of the responsibility for caring for sick family members. And this, of course, also had a significant impact on their learning. So we now experience the similar dynamics of girls at risk as a result of COVID-19. It should also be borne in mind that the, the, the learning losses that were caused by the pandemic could also re will, will result in lo lost earning amounting to a tenth of the global G GDP, a tenth of the global GDP. And the failure, of course, to achieve the foundational skills um, um, has profoundly negative consequences for individual children and adolescents. And their ability to fulfill their story, to live their life, Tell the, um, and achieve their potential and, and be of use to their societies and the world at large. So, and this again, is going to be felt by those who are suffering extreme poverty in the midst of a conflict, in the midst of a refugee situation, in the midst of a climate induced disaster and the pandemic. I just need to keep repeating, we are speaking about shilling and youth that are within the mission of education cannot wait, that have lost everything and are suffering, enduring a total deprivation of all their human rights with education at the heart of it. So, so, so it's not just one trauma or one crisis, it's all possible crises that can impact a child or an adolescent. And that's why the mission of education cannot wait has to be uh, a bit more uh, forceful um, than normal because we are speaking up for those who are suffering brute force. Now we come to Africa. We all agree Africa is the forgotten crisis of the world. In Africa, the impacts of COVID-19 has, has created against the prolongation of the fact that these are very brutal throughout the prolonged crisis. So COVID-19 has just added to that. Take a country like the Democratic Republic of Congo that has been at conflict and, it's just, and now is suffering multiple conflicts internally since the 60s, if not um, earlier. Uh, and many African countries are on the front line of climate emergency and extreme weather conditions. And we see desertification. We see conflicts between pastoralists and agriculturalists. So there's a direct correlation between their suffering, their struggle for survival, and what is actually happening to the agrable land um, and, the, and the scarcity of resources, uh, natural resources. And as a result of, of that in, 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 in Africa, about 40 million children and youth are having their education disrupted every year. 40 million children and youth in Africa every year, every year. 10 years, 400 million. So just keep multiplying those figures. Uh, in, um, just to give examples, in Zambia, Kenya, and Madagascar, 
they have experienced a chronic food crisis over the past year. Um, and they're worsening existing development challenges has been there for a while that have now led to humanitarian emergencies, which are underreported. That's why they are forgotten. In Somalia, migration related to climate crisis has, and, and Somalia is a country where climate is important for their survival. And because of the climate crisis has exacerbated besides conflict, besides violence, besides terror, has exacerbated displacement um, uh, further um, from, in addition to the ongoing conflict. And in 2020, displacement related to this concurrent crisis in Somalia led to girls' enrollment dropping. Girls' enrollment, just in Somalia in 2020, their enrollment dropped from 45% to 29%. And it just keeps dropping. It's important to bear in mind, we're not dealing with status quo. It's, it's, we are dealing with something that is heading towards the abyss. We are going just yes, plunging. This, they, these children and youth and girls are plunging into the abyss. And it's up to you to save them before they hit the ground and are smashed. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has claimed 100,000 African lives and nearly 4 million um, uh, cases have been recorded today. 4 million COVID cases recorded today. That's a huge number. Now, the effects of the pandemic, as I have said, have compound crisis um, who are who were there before COVID and who have actually been worsening doing a COVID in Africa. And of course, it, these are these are realities of it, abnormal situations for them. Um, and, and, and they will continuously be disastrous for many children and young people across the entire African continent whose families have migrated as a result of flood, drought, and other climate disasters and conflict. So, so we are speaking again and extreme poverty and the possibility of famine. So these children urgently need remedial action to tackle uh, and ac access learning equalities so that we can prevent further dropout. And we, we need to meet the educational needs of them um, and, and make sure that they can access equality inclusive education that pays particular attention to girls and also children with disabilities and other marginalized group. And I, I, I just want to stress this because I know how important this is for Ireland. And, and as, as, as also what I was introduced, I'm a human rights lawyer by training. Education is the very foundation for human rights. Yes, imagine to, to achieve due process, uh, right to work, um, good governance, uh, fairness, socioeconomic equity without an educated nation. It's logically not possible. So education is the stepping stone to achieve all other human rights. It's the stepping stone to achieve all other sustainable development goals. And that's why I always say, when we make our priorities as a, as a, as a, as a as a, as a strategic donor partner, do we want to fill holes or do we want to put the foundation in place to achieve all human rights and all sustainable development goals? Well, education for those left furthest behind is that foundation. So it's, it's also logically, how do we most cost effectively manage taxpayers' money to achieve more rights, more sustainable development goals through one investment rather than scattering our investments. Now I want to bring you back to the, to, to the realities on the ground. Um, and as we call on world leaders, and here I count the Security Council uh, amongst them, but there are world leaders in 193 member states of the United Nations, and there are world leaders in the private sectors, um, and those who, who sit with enormous financial resources is um, I want all of us to be transported back to the reality. And, and I can go back to April when Mr. Filippo Grandi of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and I together traveled to Modale, the refugee site in North Ubangi province of the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is at the border of Central African Republic. It was a seven and a half hour trip just to go back and forth uh, from Kinshasa over 
dirt roads, flying, um, um, bulletproof car, and so forth. Um, and of course, our journey was nothing compared to the journey of the refugees we met, who was much more um, um, traumatizing. They have been fleeing across the forest for weeks with barely the clothes on their bodies, and we went to meet with them. And what we witnessed at the border between the Democratic Republic of Congo and Central African Republic was an absolutely profound humanitarian crisis of human suffering in its extreme laid bare for young, young people, uh, for children, girls and boys, adolescents, um, and, um, and amounting to 4.7 million of them who were in need of urgent, life-saving protection and education. 17, 70% of these children from the Central African Republic and the youth had never been to school before. I mean, just imagine that they had been so forgotten. We only found them when we went to the border and they became refugees. They never gone to a school. So here, we, we, we see, we saw, and I think they represent an entire generation of children and youth that are risk to be left so far behind that they will never ever catch up. Impossible. And here, not to forget the trauma they suffered, the need for mental health and psychosocial support. He has to help them sit in a classroom. He has to be able to absorb learning. You know, the brain capacity, the ability to become focused, concentrated. We are speaking about the need for massive resources to give them a holistic education that make them healthy learners uh, because they have fled chaos that we cannot even imagine. Chaos of rape, seeing the mothers raped, their sisters raped, their fathers killed, and so forth. I mean, the cruelty is gruesome and it's inexplicable. Um, so if anyone in the world deserves our support and sharing and solidarity, it's them. And um, they come there and they've lost everything. They're totally dispossessed. And they live in far from their homes. They hardly have food to eat. And if we don't come in and support them with education, a protective environment, the mental health, the school nutrition, and give them a hope, well, what do people without hope do? What do they do? What will we do when we lose hope? And I think it's important to take a step back and reflect on that, uh, and that it requires our empathy to do so. Now, in Central African Republic, and I said that 70% uh, of those who are arriving have never gone to school, one in every four schools in, in Central African Republic is non-functional because of the fighting that has taken place uh, and half of the country's children are out of school. And they are the lost girls and the lost boys of Africa. And this Central African Republic and Africa children are not lost just in DRC. They have also fled across the border into Cameroon, into Chad and other neighboring countries. And then on top of it, as we have seen, uh, when we discuss the Safe Schools Declaration and international humanitarian law and international human rights law, is that we see crimes against humanity and war crimes in that their schools that are supposed to be protected under these legal frameworks and declarations are being targeted for attacks. Students are attacked, the teachers are attacked, and the communities live in constant fear. Try to just imagine how education can be perceived as a threat uh, for a child to learn an environment like that. You constantly have to look over your shoulders. You don't dare to go to school because you might be kidnapped by Boko Haram. Um, the reports that we see in Northern Burkina Faso, the children are so scared of even being caught with the learning materials. So when they do their homework, they, they sit in the sand ready you know, and draw their homework just in case somebody appears that threaten them with their lives for learning, so they quickly can erase the sound. This is the, the creativity of the children and the teachers, but it also shows the absurdity of it all. That's, that's the kind of fear that they experience just to exercise their right 
to learn. And the right to learn meaning the right to be a human being. Evolvement or learning is part of a human journey. They have to erase it as fast as possible in the sand to save their life. That's how they live. And with, with the recent um, earthquake in Haiti, if you allow me to move to the rest of the world, because suffering is, is just all encompassing in our globe today. Humanity is in a huge crisis. Yeah, with the recent earthquake in Haiti now and the operating context in Afghanistan, um, Africa's in, uh, crisis uh, are often, well, they're easily forgotten. We also have to, to have a look at Afghanistan and Haiti without losing the sight of Africa, which overall for a long and will always be those absolutely left for us behind. But we do, of course, need to be very strong on um, um, girls' education in Afghanistan. I have worked and lived there, fairly familiar with the country, and will will lead a mission there in October. And we have um, just um, uh, released two first emergency responses to both Afghanistan and uh, to Haiti. But let us go back to Africa. The scale of this crisis are staggering. You, according to UNHR, Sub-Saharan Africa hosts more than 26% of the refugees' world population. That's over 18 million people in, in the region in Africa, 18 million people are of concern to UNHR. And that number has soared in recent years, partly due to the ongoing crisis in Central African Republic, in Nigeria, and in Sudan. But it's also as a result of new conflicts, which has erupted in Burundi, Ethiopia, uh, uh, and in Yemen. So the world's attention is too easily grabbed by other headline events. And so they lose out on their education because they just don't make it to the news. And that's where education, we have a fantastic advocacy team and we have a fantastic ex and high-level steering group. They work with us to get this out. Um, but that's why we are there to try to get the news attention. This year, we have seen in Burkina Faso, the deterioration with a further 1.4 million uh, internally displaced. This is an increase of 4% in July this year alone. In the neighboring Niger, we have seen the brunt of instability across the whole Sahel. That, and Sahel hosts the largest numbers of refugees and internally displaced in the region. And we are launching a big program in MIRP, and I hope to be there personally in, in 10 days. Um, but UNHR as refugees uh, has, has estimated in Niger, they have reached that 600,000, over a million refugees, IDPs and asylum seekers due to the insecurity of the armed attacks. And in Cameroon, and Jan Egeland and the Norwegian Refugee Council, the Secretary General of the Norwegian Refugee Council, referred to it as the most neglected crisis affected on the country, uh, country on earth. So we have three concurrent protracted crises here, three concurrent uh, protracted crises in different parts of one country. In Cameroon, there are three countries uh, uh, in, in one country, impacting thousands of children in terms of the right to equality education. In Cameroon, of all neglected crises, Cameroon top a loss, the loss, the, the list of the most neglected crises. And again, Education Academy of Wait have provided first emergency response and are coming in with a big multi-year investment to which, of course, all our partners can contribute. And these are, these are joint programs coordinated through the United Nations, multilateral. We have to save the multilateralism of the United Nations and give it the chance to do what it's good at. Through the coordination of the UN system, we develop our joint programs that bring in different UN agencies, the government, and uh, civil society and such program we will have in Cameroon and we want everyone to come in on that and help us uh, fully fully fund it. Um, with no education and we know that and no lifeline um, they have very few options and I've said that before um, if you don't have an education and you're living in this abnormal environment 
um, and unless we take extraordinary action in response to that abnormal environment, they will be at a far higher risk for sexual, sexual exploitation and violence and early pregnancies. And then it's finished, no more chance. This, we can't save them after that. And the boys, they will do what boys do if they're offered a few pennies to support their families, they will join armed groups and terror groups, Boko Haram, and they will turn to kidnapping these girls. So these lost, you know, the lost girls will become the victims of the lost boys who have become the victim themselves. So the vicious circles of victims um, and victimization and suffering. So the, the children should, should be in school and learning will instead start being the persecuted and the victims and the cycle will never, never end. Now, I have given you a few examples in conclusion on what education cannot wait does. Um, we believe that while we see all the suffering, we see the gloom and we see the, 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 the challenges, the threats, you can make a difference, you can, it's possible. As a matter of fact, that's probably one of the biggest reasons we're in this world, come and make it better. So it's up to us to provide those extraordinary solutions to abnormal problems because we live in a, in, a, in a more privileged part of the world. And as a global fund, the United Nations Global Fund for Education and Emergencies, we were created precisely um, to position, reposition education. And again, uh, I'd like to give the credibility to, to or the, the credit for that to the, to the UN Special Envoy for Global Education, Gordon Brown, who conceived of education cannot wait because he wanted less bureaucracy and more accountability towards those we serve and was very keen to see this big part of the multilateral UN system. So this would not have taken place. And then he was supported by UN member states, UN agencies and civil society. And here we are today, that is becoming a reality, but there's so much work to do. Now, shortly after WHO declared a pandemic, what did this W do? Um, just within two weeks, we actually moved um, and um, we were just, just, just a little bit behind OCHA, the, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Crisis that moved a bit faster, but two weeks is still a very fast time. And within 21 days, we had mobilized $23 million and then an additional $22.4 million uh, um, a couple of months later and distributed to 85 grantees in 32 crisis affected countries. Over 75% of our COVID-19 force were dispersed within weeks. This is the fastest disbursement of funds to date. We like to quote Martin Luther King on that one. The fears emerge, the fears urgency of now. It's now, it's not tomorrow, it's not next year, it's now. It's right now. So that's how we operate. And we were able to do so because we used the UN multi, uh, multi, international, multilateral coordination system and we have brilliant partners on the ground, uh, agencies and NGOs. And um, we reached in total 29.2 million children adolescents. 51% were girls, including 49%, um, 1.4 million refugees of whom 49% were girls. And we also reached 1 million internally displaced with our COVID-19 response. Be beyond our COVID-19 response, we continued our multi-year programming, which is what Rory referred to as the humanitarian development nexus, because that is the future. We are no longer going to have the isolation of gaps, humanitarians there and development there. Today, it's about working together in solidarity in one joint program. And that's also part of the UN Secretary General reform program, joint programming. And that is another reason why we are able to move so fast. We created an additional eight programs, bringing the total number of 
18 multi-year programs in 18 countries where we have brought everyone together under one program and divided roles and responsibilities depending on added value. And across these programs, girls are one of our top priorities. It is our top priority. Every investment needs to entail 60% girls. And it's not just a number, it's the curriculum, it's the training of female teachers. It's also the training of boys in their learning to respect girls and respect women. And show that there's protective mechanisms around the school so that they can't get kidnapped, making sure sanitation is there for them. So that is one of our top priority. And other top priority, and we share many priorities with Ireland um, besides this, but one is our strong commitment to a rights-based approach based on international law, IHL, human rights law, and the Safe School Declaration. So that's another one. And also to bear in mind, all the children and youth that are um, um, uh, affected by uh, disability or another ability. And, and they need to be given particular, because they are usually the ones, usually the ones that are hidden at home. I mean, we've seen in countries, they are chained to walls in their homes, so no one can see them. And then of course, we have other groups that are invisible, such as the LGBTQT community, how can we support them without exposing them or groups because of different ethnicity or because of a different background or race or religion? We need to make sure that human rights without discrimination is part of education cannot wait's mission. Um, so what can we do? Well, we have a UN charter that promised all generations to respect human rights and to build a more peaceful and prosperous world, we believe that education is the starting point for that. That is the way to end um, uh, poverty, violence, social inequity around the globe. Uh, and the, if anyone doubts that, then just look at the reverse. If an, a nation is not educated, how can we achieve anything of that? And um, we, 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 we need to increase the spending gap on COVID-19 and education cannot wait. It has mobilized 1.8 billion to date. In just a few years, 1 million in country against our multi-year programs and force and um, 800 million in our trust fund, we are going to call on world leaders for 1 billion. 1 billion. We need to scale up and we need to scale up uh, fast. We, it's all in our head, our attitude, how we think, but it's also in our heart. How do we empathize? How do we put ourselves in their situation? And when there is a feeling of empathy, of solidarity, understanding that we have a responsibility for humanity and the next generation, that feeling will automatically trigger action and it will remove fear to speak truth to power. And that truth is that every child, every girl, every adolescent in forgotten crisis, in conflict, in refuge, has an inherent right to a quality education. And by supporting that right, by financing that right until these countries can rebuild, by doing so, we are contributing to our shared humanity. We can also contribute to a further deterioration of the world. So we need to come together and we cannot wait. And I would say education cannot wait, but humanity cannot wait. These children cannot wait. The youth cannot wait. These countries can no longer wait. So let me conclude by thanking you again, Irish I aid um, and, and uh, IIEA for hosting this um, event. And um, we, we, we believe as Ireland uh, has shown such a great commitment again and again, always. And I followed Ireland many years, even before I took on my job in education, I cannot wait. For so many years to try to bring the world to a better place based on international law. And to commend you for signing the deal for engagement in fragile states and committing to the OECD DAC recommendations on the humanitarian development nexus, as Rory mentioned, really commendable. Let's get everyone with us. Let's get the Security Council with us. Let's get the whole UN member states with us on that. And let's get the private sector with us on this. And um, 
we all together, we are going to stand hand in hand with Ireland um, in this struggle politically um, and also in delivering real um, results on the ground. And um, education cannot wait. They call us a young fund. We might be a young fund, but very much short fund. Uh, we are a mature global fund today. Um, and uh, we have a proven model through evaluations that this is uh, the new way of working as in the SS reform program that actually deliver results and does so with speed and less bureaucracy. And um, largely because we were allowed to be disruptive. We were envisaged to be disruptive. And uh, I, I will end here. Um, by saying thank you for organizing this event. Thank you for being such a role model example for the rest of the world to follow. And Count on Education cannot wait to do anything to put your work and your commitment and your value system out there um, in our shared mission. And thank you for having me here today. Thank you. We can make it happen. We'll do it together. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Yasmin, for that passionate uh, delivery. And I think you painted a very vivid picture of the scale of the, the, the need and uh, both for funding, but, but for political action as well. Mm. So, so thank you so much for that. So maybe I can start off with there's a couple of questions coming in, but maybe I can start off just asking about that, that the scale of it, as you say, you know, and a ma massive resources are needed for a holistic response. And uh, there have been significant pledges made quite recently from, well, from, from the EU, from the US, from Ireland. And just how far has that gone to address some of those? And maybe speak a little bit more to what more do political leaders need to do to really um, drive the, 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 the sources of funding that you need? And I would like to add just a, a comment we have in from, from a member of the audience, if you don't mind. Uh, it's from uh, Dara Moriarty. Um, uh, he has um, given a question in that uh, he got from the audience that uh, any comment on uh, the British government's um, decision over the summer to cut its development aid budget from 0 0.7 of GNI to 0 0.5. So maybe we start with a bigger picture on the funding pledges that have been made recently and how far that goes and what more is needed. And then looking at the um, the UK government's decision and, and your reaction to that, please. Well, um, as I mentioned during the, the opening is that so far Education Cannot Wait has mobilized 1.8 billion. That includes last week's commitments um, 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 divided between our trust fund and our in-country programming. There are two ways to fund education cannot wait. Straight into the trust fund or take that, that program in-country facilitated by SW and fund it directly because, you know, many, many, many member states have missions in-country with their own envelopes and others do it from the central level. Now, it's, it's been in that sense more than we had expected for this year because there was the GPE replenishment and we had economic recession. So we, we took it a little bit low profile to allow that to take place, the GPE replenishment, and then we would start. But I think um, what we have done in crisis and the fact that more and more governments are now using their resources for those left for us behind automatically turned to education cannot wait because the results were, were very obvious. And as a result of the funding raised so far, we have provided um, 4.6 4 children uh, and youth with an inclusive, holistic, continued, sustained quality education. You go back a few years, they didn't have it. Today they have it. And when I speak of the holistic, it's, it's from the humanitarian development access, they will be able to go to school and actually learn with real learning outcome in the middle of a crisis or a refugee situation. In addition, we have reached 29.5 million children during COVID-19 to prevent their, their, their disruption of their school. And we now have investments in 38 
crisis affected countries or refugee hosted countries. So this is just a little bit less than four years. And I, I would say, and it's not being pretentious, it's more to inspire. ECW is, and I've been in the UN since for just over 30 years around the UN, uh, is, is the fastest UN initiative I have seen in the UN. And I think that's why we have so much support from the Secretary General Guterres and the Deputy Secretary General, I mean, Mohammed and the heads of UN agencies, because they look at them and say, wow, this is incredible how they've been able. So this is, this is what we have been able, for instance, during Afghanistan, the Taliban came on the 15th of August, but we were able to work with our partners in country, UNICEF was one of them, Save the Children, another, the Vidyan Refugee Council together and reach girls in Taliban areas well before uh, Taliban took over Kabul. We've been doing this for years in Taliban areas. So that's one reason I'm going to Afghanistan in a few weeks is to reinforce what already has been done, the president said. Um, so we've been able to we've been able to go into Central African Republic where you have 12 different militia groups and reach reach those children because we, we differ from other other actors or funds in that we work with governments, but we are not bound by them because we exercise humanitarian principles. So we go to Yemen, there's de facto and a de jure government, doesn't mean that we will only work with the de jure government. We will make our own humanitarian assessment together with UN actors. So this is how far we have come. Um, politically, one of the UN's fastest moving initiatives, education is becoming globally recognized as Rory said, as a priority, uh, and the enormous resources mobilized we are going to ask for another billion dollar because the number of children reached, we, we, when we started Education Cannot Wait or Gordon Brown brought it to the World Humanitarian Summit, the estimation was 75 million children and youth without a quality education. As a result of COVID, you're speaking about 128 million children and youth. And when you look at, at, at the, the, the funding we come over on with, when you look at the OECD countries, you're speaking about ten, eleven thousand dollars a year for a child's education, and you go to the forgotten crisis in Africa, and you're trying to provide a quality education with 152 million dollars. That's not okay. So funding, one billion is our next goal, so that we will be able to say very soon we have mobilized three billion, then five billion, then ten billion, then twenty billion. And with that, we hope to achieve the other human rights and, the, and sustainable development goals. Um, I will not um, uh, comment on um, the British government's decisions. These are internal decisions, uh, and that's not my job. But I can say that the UK is um, uh, education cannot wait um, leading donor. It, it, it UK was not only there to fund, to establish education cannot wait. They came in with the largest contribution and set the new stage for education cannot wait. Um, two years ago, with over a hundred million dollars to education cannot wait. No one had ever done that before. Initially, they looked at education cannot wait, we'll put five million, two million. They came in and broke all ground. So they are Education Cannot Wait's number one donor. They have chosen to put education as their top priority in girls' education. Germany follows suit now and came in last week with 50 million euros. Then the EC came with 25 million uh, euros adding to previous funding that the EC has given us over the years. Everyone is shifting. They're saying, no, we're just not going to throw the remnants of all other international aid to educate. No, we're going to put education at the center. So, so I think the UK um, um, made a pitch for education cannot wait um, uh, at an early stage. And as a result, other European and American, America came in with 37 million last, last week and have, have previously also both the, and the population movement and refugee and the State Department. Um, so I, I have only positive things to say about my partners.
Great, thank you. And that's very encouraging to hear that that funding is coming in. I have a comment and a question here from Charles Amote, a high school teacher from a remote part of Kenya. Uh, he's a human rights educator and a coordinator of Amnesty Clubs Kenya. So very much from a human rights background. So he, um, first of all, thanks you. Thanks you for your, for your expression uh, on the education crisis. And he, he makes a comment that in Kenya, the pandemic has pushed many girls uh, to early pregnancies, as you said yourself, and many, um, in many cases of sexual violence. Um, and also, you know, boys being pushed out of school um, and into drug and um, substance abuse, which I suppose is yet another um, consequence of that. So in terms of the, those issues that he raises, um, he wonders what initiatives and support to schools have been given to address those particular issues within, within the, the um, response that's given by the organisation and, and by the fund. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, when it comes to Kenya, I know we have invested in refugees during COVID-19 and we work with a specific, specific allocation to Kenya. Um, and we will continue to do so uh, as we are facing the crisis. The, the, the challenge we have with Kenya, well, it's for good and for bad, Kenya would normally not count as one of these W's um, uh, priority countries because for to qualify as a country for for education cannot wait because we, we have a very targeted approach I mean you have the global fund for education uh, partnership for education we are targeted our focus is specifically emergencies protracted crisis climate change endemics pandemics but climate change refugees displaced and conflict so we are a crisis and that's why we are inside the united nations because that gives us the access and the political leverage but we also work with non-governmental organizations teachers school administration so so um uh, to make a long answer short we have supported refugees in kenya because of the virtue the fault by them being refugees but normally the countries that we focus on in Africa are the Camerons, the Burkina Faso, the Central African Republic, because they have multiple crises um, that, that relates to emerges and protracted crisis. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and maybe just going back to um, the climate uh, crisis and its impact in, in the areas where, where you are working. Um, what more can be done to raise awareness of the impact of climate change on education in emergency settings? And is there a danger that we're, we're addressing these in a siloed way? And, and also be um, interesting to hear your comments on whether or not climate security should also be on the COP agenda and whether we should be just raising awareness of the, the intersectionality of, of the issues. It's a great question. It's one of my favorite questions uh, because it's about connecting dots. You know, the great Italian painter once, once said, um, um, Leonardo da Vinci once said, um, learn to see the whole thing, connect the dots. He said something along those lines. Uh, everything is interrelated. And we have come to a point in, 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 in our evolution, we can't look at things as scattered silos, everything is interrelated. We are one humanity. And so is climate change, security, education. Uh, it's all interrelated. Now, the, the interrelation between climate change, security, and education is very simple. Where there is climate change, either you have um, cyclones, drought, earthquakes, or desertification. That's a climate change, right? you will have um, scarcity of resources. When you have scarcity of resources, you will have conflict. When you have conflict, you will have violations of humanitarian law and you will have terror and you will have the war machinery. And when you have that, you have refugees who are internally displaced. And when you have refugees and return are in displaced, they are running. And when you run, you can't stay in school. And when you don't stay in school, you cannot build, come back and build back, back better and recover. As a matter of fact, you may be drawn into that cycle of violence. And that altogether creates instability, threatening national security, 
but most of all human security. The moment you threaten human security, you bet you're gonna threaten national security. That's where it starts. Give people, young people security, physical, legal security to go to school and learn and rebuild and build a life, you will have national security. If you don't, there will be no national security. So that is what the relation is. You don't need to make this into a very complicated formula. How do we climate change and education belong? I just sort of outlined it. This happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. I think it should be on COP, COP26. I think we need to speak openly and honestly with intellectual, on, intellectual honesty, how everything is interrelated. Thank you so much, uh, Yasmin. I think um, you you very clearly outline how these things are connected and, and, and the need for um, a political resolution and, and also um, some practical solutions. And, and I think as you talked about the work of Education Canada Wage, it is very practical, but takes that whole human rights framework into account. And, and that's really important. Um, I think we have time for, for one last question, if that's okay with you. Um, and maybe it's just to ask you about um, just how much innovation you saw emerging in the response to COVID. Because as you said, you reached 29.2 um, vulnerable girls and boys. That's an amazing rapid response. Um, did you see in terms of the proposals that were coming forward, because obviously the model had to change of delivery, that there was lots of innovations coming at that time. Um, and will these be useful going forward? Well, I, Sorry. yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, I, I, I like often to re refer to creativity, is the creativity of survival. And, and the, the first responders are the communities themselves. But I, I, I and, and, and my colleagues will have many more examples of innovations. But you have countries like Afghanistan, there is no electricity whatsoever. You know, if, if you fly from at night from Iran, across Iran, and then you cross into Afghanistan, you know exactly when you cross the border because it goes pitch black. Why does it go pitch black? There's no electricity. Forget about Wi-Fi. The digital divide is a result of an absolute lack of infrastructure, which is a result of an absolute lack of socioeconomic equity. So in Afghanistan, the teachers did what they could. They picked up um, I'm going out of focus. They picked up books and walked in their villages from, from, from uh, uh, house to house to drop off the homework, the exams, and then they would come at the end of the week to pick it up. So that's, is it innovative? Well, it is innovative if you don't have a classroom and you can't go to school. They do what, you do what you can with what you have where you are. In the most of the countries where you have a lack of electricity or you have very scarcity of this, uh, and, and you don't have computers and all this technology because most of our countries don't, um, using radio, using radio, um, uh, using children's clubs or youth clubs where they can come together through radio and making sure they have all social protocol and the sanitation in place um, and, and quickly training teachers how to deal with COVID and social protocol. I mean, this is creativity for survival, I would say. Um, if I am to say, well, we came up with this incredible technological solution, um, I would be lying because you don't have electricity. Um, but we have also seen uh, the use of solar systems and we paid for it in many of the countries where you lack a proper infrastructure. But that's also... It also reminded to all of us that the digital divide um, showed us during COVID-19 of the socioeconomic divide that persists between the North and the South. Yasmin, I, we run out of time, but I want to thank you so much on behalf of the IIEA and on behalf of Irish Aid. I mean, I think your, your delivery here today, I think has inspired us all. Um, you've spoken to great values, you've spoken to localization, to human rights, and I, as I said before, such practical solutions for the most vulnerable, um, and you've painted a very vivid picture for us. So thank you so much. Uh, we've greatly thank enjoyed you. it, and uh, we'll continue to support you. And uh, yes, the, the very best of luck with that funding gap and, uh, and with the really important work. So thank you. 
Thank you, Filora. Thank you, IHA. Thank you, IEA, and all of you who listened. Thank you. It's been my pleasure and privilege.